The Redemption of John Parker by John Connell. In this scene, young John Parker has just gotten into another fight with another colored boy. He is scolded by his owner, kindly Doc Whittaker. The housemaid, Cookie, advises him. Interior, doctor's home, day. Doc paces, angry. Cookie washes the bruises on John's face. I ain't no African slave. I was born American. What's the difference? Slave is a slave, and you're a slave. Just like me. I ain't like nobody. I's... I'm me. Cookie snatches John's cap from his head and swats him. Take off your hat when you's talking to a white man. John glares at her. She mimes shush to cool him down. Doc, why do they call coloreds nigger? It's derivative. Corruption of Niger, the Latin for black. Negro in Spanish. We Americans are too ignorant to know Latin and too lazy to pronounce it Spanish, so... He notes the intense interest in John's eyes. One thing is certain. Before you ever learn how to be a normal houseboy, I'll be a ballerina. John guffaws at the image. Cookie swats him again. So, Monday morning, either you go apprentice as a plasterer, or you're off to the black belt to pick cotton. Choose your path wisely, John. You're at a crossroads. Crossroads? More like an Alabama fork with a prong powerful bend. Cookie whips him across the shoulders with the washcloth. Doc Whitaker shakes his head and stomps out. Cookie immediately stops the whipping and wipes his bruises. What's the matter with you? Child, I done saved you from a real whooping. He's out of control. He's the fat and foolish color boy I ever met for sure. Well, he put me on my metal. With all that metal in you, it's a shame you got such a wooden head. John laughs, but winces at her not-so-tender ministrations. That boy just projecting himself because he be free colored. How did colored get to be free? Some's born in free state. Some's get themselves a trade, hires out for dollars and buys their freedom, and some just up and runs away. Where's this promised land they all be running to? Illinois, Ohio, Canada. Somebody says follow the North Star and off it goes, damn fools. Widow Ryder told me she knowed a colored man in Philadelphia was a lawyer, and another even a doctor. How'd they do that? Learning. Learning's worth more money. With learning, you got choices. But it ain't the coloreds. Leastwise, not in Alabama. Why not? Who says a colored can't do something or be what he wants to be? It ain't right, that's sure. Cookie holds him by the shoulders. John Parker, don't try stepping above your raisin. Stop fighting and hating everybody and set things the way they is. Nothing you can say, nothing you can do. She grabs him by the ear. A patient man, he got great understanding, but a quick-tempered man, he just plumb stupid. She whacks him with the bar of soap. John splashes water in her face, gives a whoop, and hightails it out the door. Cookie gives chase, brandishing the washcloth. Get back here, spawn of Satan! But the door slams in her face. She flops down on a chair. Boy ain't made for this world. Can't back down from nothing. Just ain't in his nature. She tosses the washcloth into the sink. But oh, this colored boy, he got something inside him special. That's for sure. Yes, Lord, this uppity nigger, he's something special. She claps and stamps her feet, laughing and shaking her head. Interior, house, bare room, youth, day. Young John trowels plaster on wall. White plasterer, forties, big, paunchy, and mean drunk, examines the work. What kind of shit job's this? What's wrong with it? What's right with it? He plunges his trowel into John's newly spread plaster. What'd you do that for? I was trying my best. It ain't right. Who are you talking to, boy? He slaps John on the head with the flat of the trowel. John roars and punches him square on the jaw, rocking him. The big man grabs him and smashes him against the wall. John collapses to the ground. The plasterer kicks him several times, grabs a broken piece of lath board and lays into him. Satiated, the man chucks the board aside and lurches out. Blood drips from two nails protruding from the lath board. John lies motionless, his head bleeding profusely. <coughs> Interior, colored hospital, youth, day. The dingy room is packed with rusted iron cots bearing patients on straw-stuffed mattresses. Young John, his head bandaged, sits on the edge of his cot, swinging and stretching his legs. A white nurse, 40s, reluctantly washes the whip-scarred back of an old patient. 
He groans each time she wipes the wounds. You better behave from now on if you don't want to end up like this one, or worse. She nods at the next bed, where a figure is draped head to foot in a shroud, or rather, a dirty white sheet. Old patient winces under nurse's rough prodding. Be still. I ain't got all day. She tosses the dirty washcloth into a dirtier bucket and moves on to the next patient. John helps old patient wrap his tattered shirt around his shoulders and lowers him gently to the mattress. The old man gratefully squeezes John's hand. Here, move this dead one into the hall. Be out of here by morning. You've been here a week already. I got two more coming in. Don't know what you niggas do to be getting whipped all the time. White nurse prods a sick woman patient awake. Up. Get up, lazy bitch. The woman struggles to turn over. John heads to the bed with the corpse and, curious, turns down the sheet. He gasps and reels backwards. Covered in ugly scars, welts, and bruises lies the corpse of the kindly, wise old slave to whom John was once shackled. <sighs> you piss this bed again? She whacks the patient with a rawhide whip. Get up, you dirty bitch. You're going to clean up this mess. Get up, I said. Leave her be. You shut your mouth. She whacks the sick woman again. I told you, get out of that bed. She raises her hand to strike again, but John roars and rips the rawhide from her grasp. Get that back, or it'll be the end of you. But John lashes her head, back, and legs. The other patients shout support, delighted to see their heartless oppressor get her just desserts. Stop! Stop, please! But John cannot. He whips her until she falls to the floor. He tosses the rawhide into the bucket of water and runs from the room, peeling off his bandages as he goes. Run, you black bastard! When they catch you, I'll have you whipped, you bone stick out! You're finished, you hear? Finished! One thing I did know, I had to get out of Mobile. Even the good doctor could not protect me. In tears, he races out of the hospital. In this scene, adult John Parker has earned his freedom <coughs> and is an established businessman. He has been threatened with death for helping runaway slaves escape. On a business trip aboard a packet boat, he faces trouble. Exterior, packet boat, adulthood, day. Lurching along the deck are three brutish Kentucky slave owners, together with Anderson, 40, a tall, slim businessman whose looks and bearing do not inspire trust. First slave owner spots John strolling towards them. Ain't that Parker? Slave stealer, you show? Let's get that son of a bitch. Third slave owner reaches into his pocket. Anderson grabs his arm. There are passengers everywhere. John, sensing danger, slips his hand inside his jacket and cocks his pistol. But he recognizes Anderson. Anderson. John, it's been a while. Anderson shakes hands. The slave owners scowl and lumber on ahead. What's going on? Kentucky slave owners. John, we've done a lot of business together, but I... <clears throat> I can't help you. These men are drunk. Killing drunk. Get off this boat as fast as you can. He hurries after his business associates. Mr. Parker, how you doing? John turns to see Will Robinson, 30, a light-skinned Ripley Freeman, a strong, gentle man with a kindly demeanor. Will, come with me. He grabs the surprised deckhand by the arm and drags him off. Interior, John's packet boat cabin, moments later. I can't help you. I worked here. Anyways, I was peace loving all my life. I was no good at fighting. Wait here till I come back. Exterior, packet boat, wheelhouse, continuous. The clean shaven captain, 35, answers John's knock. Mr. Parker, welcome aboard. We carrying some of your freight? Not this trip. Listen, Captain, if you don't help me, somebody's going to get killed. We're about to cast off. Come in. Interior, John's packet boat cabin. Short time later. John bounds in. Will is a wreck. It's all arranged. Captain says you can stay here tonight. Keep watch. He checks his pistols and gives one to Will. In case. You know anything about guns? I saw a man got shot once. Keep an eye open. If I miss Ripley, they'll drag me off from Kentucky and skin me alive. John flops onto the bed and pulls his derby over his eyes. Interior, John's packet boat cabin, adulthood, day. Will, the deckhand, is asleep on the floor. John leaps out of bed. Ah, damn. Will! 
He peers out the porthole. We're halfway to Maysville, Kentucky. What you gonna do? John cracks open the outdoor door and looks out. On deck, first and second slave owners stand guard. Back to scene. John skips across the room to the inboard door and checks the inboard passageway. Third slave owner stands guard, bored, shuffling to and fro. Back to scene. They don't know you. Go ask the captain to land me on the Ohio side, anywhere. I can't. I, I, I'm scared. If you don't help me, I'm done for. Be after y'all. Cut her loose. You can row across the river yourself. Give me that pistol. I'll cover. He looks out again at the inboard passageway. No one. John slips out and signals Will. They head aft. Exterior, packet boat, stern. Will climbs over the side into the yawl and unties the guy rope bracing her bow. John unties the one holding the stern. Bang! A shot winds past. Will drops low inside the yawl. Two slave owners rush towards them. John fires. Bang! First slave owner falls. Second slave owner ducks into a cabin. John vaults into the teetering yawl. He and Will struggle to untie two more ropes still holding her to the packet boat. The yawl's stern breaks free and smashes into the river. The impact throws the two overboard. John catches the gunwale and hooks onto it. He hears a thud and Will's gasp of pain. Will? Will? No answer. The yawl, still attached at her bow by one rope, bounces dangerously in the wake of the paddle wheels. John hangs on, choking in the fast-flowing river. He surfaces and looks up at the packet boat's stern rail, where Anderson, his Kentucky acquaintance, stares blankly at him. Anderson, the rope! For God's sake, man, cut it! Anderson disappears. John bounces along with the skip in the yawl. He roars, mustering strength to fight. Finally, whoosh! The yawl drops into the river, pitches wildly and rocks from side to side. Gradually, she settles. John pulls himself aboard and rolls into the flooded bottom, where he loses consciousness. Exterior, Kentucky side, riverbank, adulthood, day. A colored child, about eight, pokes the ground with a stick. Bump. The packet boat's yawl hits the bank, reviving John. He fishes out the oars and sets them in the oar locks. Where am I, boy? Kentucky, where are you going? Ohio. Want to come with me? The little boy shakes his head. You got a mammy? The child smiles and nods enthusiastically. You tell your mammy John Parker said she's to take good care of you. You hear? The little boy nods, serious, and runs off, waving goodbye. John waves back, but as he rows, his expression saddens.